Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to First Contacts, Native Americans Meet Europeans, a professional development webinar sponsored by America in Class from the National Humanities Center. I'm Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session, <clears throat> which is our first seminar in our 2015-16 seminar series. Now, let me briefly introduce the National Humanities Center. We are a research institute located in uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. We provide fellowships to scholars from this country and abroad who come to the center to research and write on topics in history, literature and language study, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. In addition, <clears throat> we offer a lot of resources for teachers of American history and literature. You found our webinars. You can find everything else that we offer uh, for um, uh, pre-collegiate teaching at americainclass.org. And if you'll go there to our lessons, you will find four lessons that are related to this evening's topic. Early visual representations of the New World, failed European colonies in the New World, the Colombian Exchange, and successful European colonies in the New World. And actually, you'll find a fifth. We just uploaded, just recently, uh, a lesson <clears throat> on Father de las Casas and his efforts to protect uh, Native Americans in uh, Mexico. So you'll find five related lessons if you just go to americainclass.org, click on that lessons uh, tag, and there you will find these lessons. And they all come equipped with what we hope are interesting and challenging and fun interactive activities for your students. In addition, we hope you check out our Pinterest page, and there you'll find a lot more resources from all of the National Humanities Center's websites for American history and literature, along with material from other websites as well. We're offering Pinterest pages on a variety of topics. Please follow us on that. I think we'll be able to provide you with a lot of really useful material for your classes. Now, at the end of our program this evening, we hope you'll go back to the website for Native Americans Meet Europeans, and there you will find uh, an evaluation. I hope you'll fill that evaluation out and send it to us. You will also find a recording of this program and the PowerPoint. And feel free to use that PowerPoint in your classes. That's what it's there for. But let me underscore that evaluation. Please fill that out and send it back to us. It's very important. Once we have that, we will send you documentation of participation in the webinar. You'll be able to present that to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit your participation in this program warrants. Now, how do you participate? Well, uh, Kathleen Duval, our scholar this evening, will be making remarks about um, contacts between uh, Native Americans and Europeans. We'll be stopping from time to time to ask questions. We hope to respond to those questions. You already know how to chat. Put your cursor in that, uh, that lower right-hand box. Uh, type your message in. Hit that send button, and it'll appear in the chat box. So you see we've already got a lot of chat going. And I will be bringing that chat into the conversation tonight at appropriate points. Now, we hope you respond to our questions, but don't be afraid to ask questions of your own or make comments. Give us feedback on how you teach this material. If you see something that you think would work well in a class, share that with us. And if you see opportunities for lessons or assignments in the material we're presenting, share that as well. One of the cardinal rules of our seminars is that the more you participate, the better the program. So please don't hesitate to jump right in and make your comments in the chat box. So let's get underway. I'm very pleased to have with us Kathleen Duval, a professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Kathleen was a center, a fellow at the National Humanities Center in 2008-9 when she worked on her most recent book, Independence Lost, Lives on the Edge of the American Revolution. It came out just a few months ago, and I read many reviews, and it was well received by uh, all sorts of critics. In addition, in 2006, she published The Native Ground, Indians and Colonists at the Heart of the Continent, and in 2009, she co-edited with John Duvall, who I think is Kathleen's father, a volume interpreting a continent, Voices from Colonial America. So let me unmute Kathleen's microphone and turn it over to her. Kathleen, how did Native Americans respond when they saw those Europeans on the horizon? Well, let's just get started with some framing questions. Uh, can you hear me all right, Richard? Yes, I think I can hear you. I hope everyone else can as well. Okay, great. Um, so it's some framing questions have for tonight. What generalizations can we make about first contacts? Why do first contacts matter? And what interpretive difficulties arise when we use sources written by Europeans to understand first contacts? And so what we'll have here tonight are some sources 
written by Europeans, some written down by Europeans, sort of as told to by natives, um, and some sort of that come to us in complicated ways that we'll talk through. So these are some things I think we need to think about as we look at these sources, whether they're written by Europeans or come to us uh, from a native perspective, but in a different way. Because what we're really looking for tonight are native perspectives on these first encounters. But the native peoples, all of the native peoples will be looking at tonight had no written language at the time of the encounter. Um, and so we have to look at these sources carefully and see how they come to us today and whether they're appropriate and in what ways they're appropriate for looking at native perspectives. So I think the first question to ask probably of any historical document, as you, you all probably already do, um, but certainly of these tonight, is what were the author's, author's motives? Who was the author? Why did the author write this down? And, and what was the audience or audiences for this document? And then we'll take that information to think about the next question. How might those motives have clouded the author's perceptions of the native people? If the author was a European directly writing things down, the way we'll see with John Smith's account later on, what does the European want to see? Um, what kinds of messages about native people does the author want to give to his audience? Um, and if the authorship was sort of mixed or possibly even native, and we'll talk about what that might mean for these first encounters. Um, what kind of people was it? Was it a native people who had good relations or um, violent relations with their native neighbors? Um, and what was the audience that the natives thought they saw, uh, thought they were speaking to when they wrote this document or told the story that came into the document that, we, that comes to us today? Kathleen, if I, if I could just jump in here for a moment. Our first question there, what were the author's motives? Could you <clears throat> suggest some motives that we might look for? Uh, what, were there you know, kind of standard motives? I know uh, Walter Raleigh was trying to get uh, colonist settlers to come to Roanoke. What, was, what, what might be some of the other motives that uh, we ought to be looking for? Well, in these early encounters, Europeans' motives are nearly always to get more funding or to in some way convince people back home to keep sending people and to fund more missions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of always something we have to keep in mind that Europeans might be writing about. Now, if it's, um, if it's Raleigh, it might be more sort of financial motives. Uh, um, if it's a priest, it might be sending more resources to convert more people. But that's almost always one of their motives. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of have to sort of filter that out to get to what truth might be behind it. Right. And you mentioned audience. Now, uh, at whom were most of these uh, documents aimed? At, at, the, at the court, the royal court? Or, uh, well, I guess in the case of, uh, well, in Raleigh, I guess it would be the royal court. But later on, it would be well after first context, would be investors in their colonies. But were these aimed primarily at the royal court? Um, well, I think you know, the first thing you just want to ask is actually that question about each source. Who is the audience? Who's it aimed at? And almost always it's, yes, it's some kind of funding source. Mm -hmm. And then the last question, can you find other sources to supplement the information in this source? We're going to be looking at texts. Um, not archaeological evidence. Does archaeological evidence shed any light on first contents, contact? It does. It, it, it can help us a lot. And um, we can look at what, uh, what people were living like. You know, there are certain kinds of things that archaeology can tell us and certain kinds of things it can't. And those are the kinds of things I think you can sort of brainstorm with students. I find that really works well with students just to ask, what can archaeology tell us? And they can say, you know, how people live, the shapes of their structures, and things like that. And then we ask, what can archaeology not tell us that we want to know about people of the past? And uh, a lot of the way that people thought and what people believed is harder to get at through archaeology. But archaeology can help a lot. And so can oral history. Most of these, uh, well, all of these that will be look, first encounters that we'll be looking at today, of course, happened a long, long time ago, hundreds of years ago. Um, and oral histories are not always directly useful for things that happened that long ago. But sometimes from descendants of the native people in question, there can be stories about the past or about creation even that can inform, uh, can sort of tell us a little bit about their worldview and what they think of the past. And, and we'll have a couple sources here um, that were recorded by native people later on um, 
that reflect backward to back to first encounters, which I think is really interesting. Um, and let me get, I actually skipped over it. Let me go back to the third question there. Can you tell what messages the native people were trying to get across? And sometimes in a source that's written by a European, you see something that is so obviously what native people, this native people was trying to get across, that it just hits you in the face. So one of my favorite examples of this that we're not reading tonight is um, Jacques Cartier when he was exploring around the St. Lawrence River. There was a group of Indians that came out to him and they, and they, uh, they came out to him in their little boats when he and some of his men were out in the rowboats coming from the ship to shore. And uh, Cartier and the French said, oh, they, they're coming at us with sticks. And, they, and so they rowed back to their ship as fast as they could. And they got on the ship. And they, they were really worried these, these natives had come out to them and uh, with, uh, pointing sticks at them. Um, and then the French sort of think about it and realize, wait, weren't those furs on the ends of those sticks? And they realize, oh, I think the message that these native people were trying to send to us was not get out of here by shaking sticks at us, but look, we have great furs to trade to you. And I think this is one of those, uh, this is an example of when uh, native people actually knew more about Europeans than Europeans uh, knew they did. Yeah, I was going to say, if they were bringing furs out, they had probably <clears throat> already realized that the, the French would like the furs. But that, that raises an interesting question there about the... Uh, the, the French response to those people waving sticks at them. Um, could you could you say a few words about the preconceptions that Europeans brought to the New World about the inhabitants of the New World and where they might have gotten those preconceptions? Well, early on, at the very earliest, the Spanish think that they've gotten to the Indies. So the things that they think about island people off the coast of Asia is what they think that the people they meet here are going to be because they think they are in the Indies. Um, so they think they are primitive compared to Europe, um, mm -hmm. but that was not an uncommon thing for anybody in the world to think. Most people in the world in the early modern period believed they were more advanced than other people. Um, and, but they, Europeans thought this was a wealthy place, so maybe not hierarchically um, impressive or you know with great buildings, but with great with the kinds of things that Europeans wanted, spices, gold, um, and, and so they're mostly, you know, mostly coming to trade early on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, if I may just add here, that lesson that I mentioned earlier about first impressions, um, that one of our related lessons, uh, does that through art. And I think it's a, <clears throat> a really good lesson that shows where yeah. some of the, the fantasy, uh, the fantastic images that people had of the New World before they actually encountered them, they're, um, some of the, uh, the New World creatures have no necks, their heads are embedded in their chests, and I suspect some Europeans were kind of surprised to discover they, they weren't. But that, that would be a good lesson I would recommend for our teachers uh, to, uh, to take a look at, to get at that question of preconceptions. Well, shall we move ahead then? Sure. So, so let's add, that, that really brings us to the question of what's a first contact, which in some ways is an artificial um, construct. So in theory, it's the first time these particular Indians have met these particular Europeans. Um, but that second item there is just as important to know, that coming to a contact, each side has its own expectations informed by its own past experiences. So for each side, it, it might be, and, it, and it, it was, trading with other people. So natives uh, had, uh, Native Americans had trade networks stretching across all of the Americas. Um, they were not it was not that unusual to meet a new people. Now the Europeans might have seemed even more different from the kinds of new people they were used to meeting, but um, they had ways of, you know, early, sort of beginning diplomacy with a new people. And same thing for Europeans. And also, sometimes when one side of a, a contact thought it was first contact between these Indians and Europeans, it wasn't. Um, so, for example, the, when Cartier met those Indians, they had obviously um, at least heard about Europeans and possibly met them before. That, that's an interesting point that you raise about the Native Americans having trade relations with other tribes. They, you say they were quite extensive. Right, right. So this is one of the things that archaeology can tell us. They've found, archaeologists have found seashells, in the middle of the continents, um, so far from their origin. They found copper from the Great Lakes spread all across North America. Um, so it's clear that whatever kind of trade it was, whether they were long distance traders or these were all sort of short distance trading operations that spread goods across the continent, 
trade had existed in, in the Americas for a long time. So then presumably news of new arrivals, European arrivals on the coast would spread inland fairly rapidly, is that fair to say? That's right. Both news of Europeans and also European goods themselves. So some of some of these early goods were traded by Europeans to uh, Native Americans on the coast and spread inland. And others, a, a tremendous amount of goods, it turns out, came through shipwrecks where uh -huh. Europeans would, uh, you know, a ship would wreck and the goods would float ashore or uh, come ashore and uh, and then be traded inland from there. Right. So in a way then, for the inland tribes, uh, first contacts might have come through um, physical objects. I mean, they may have ended That's up... That's right, with, yeah. Yeah, so they, then, they, then they meet up with the people who made that axe or that knife or uh, whatever it is, and certainly mm -hmm. their expectations of what those people would be like would, be, would have been shaped by the, uh, the commodity. So sort of uh, inland cargo cults um, until, they, <laughs> <laughs> until they met up right. with the, the French or the right. British or, or whoever. Yeah, and sometimes the goods had been changed dramatically. Like a copper kettle might have been completely cut up and into other into jewelry, say, and so yeah. you might meet sort of you know meet European goods for the first time in a quite different form from the way they crossed the Atlantic. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay, now I noticed the third point here. Usually, the the first context you say are usually important for the future, although the Native Americans did not necessarily see it as such. Why did they not see it as such? Um, so I, I think I, I sort of put this in there to counter the expectation that this, like meeting Europeans for the first time, immediately and dramatically changed the Native world. Um, I, we can't really assume that happened, and a lot of times it, it seems like it was sort of run of the mill. Especially if somebody didn't see a ship. We're going to see a couple cases here where somebody sees a ship, mm -hmm. and um, coastal Native peoples and people who live near rivers had um, a, a sort of. At canoes and uh, extremely large canoes in some cases, um, but usually not. Uh, but as far as we know, not sailing ships. So sailing ships looked quite different. Mm -hmm. That that's an interesting point. Uh, if <clears throat> I imagine you would have a different impression of people uh, if you saw them coming on a on a, a galleon, a large ship that you probably have never seen a ship of that size before. And we're going to see that in some of the passages mm -hmm. you you uh, excerpted for us. But I know in uh, in Western North Carolina, a Desoto shows up through the mountains. So he's right, he's, right. he's marching through the woods. Do we have any <laughs> any sense of uh, how people respond to that? Did we're going to see uh, in a moment that um, the Aztecs thought uh, Cortez was a god? Do we have any indication uh, of the uh, the Indians and in, in the eastern and in the interior in the east seeing Desoto as he made his way through the east as a god? How how did how did that? How, what difference did it make if they come crashing through the woods? On a village, or the the village, or the villagers see the sails on the horizon. Well, most European explorers came just with a handful of people, so uh -huh. they did not look that impressive. Um, you know, if somebody comes crashing through the woods with only a handful of people, often having sort of wandered a long way and run out of goods and had to leave your armor behind by the time you get there, so um, the way you presented yourself at first mattered a lot. At first, Desoto had a large army, um, which was rare for explorations of North America, um, but DeSoto had a large army, and, and I don't think there's much evidence of people thinking he was a god, but they certainly realized that he was somebody very powerful and somebody they wanted on their side. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to get to that business of size in just a moment. Shall we move ahead? Sure. Um, so just to give some background, um, many of you will already know this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, the Aztec Empire... Um, by the time that the Spanish arrived in the 1500, was ruled by Montezuma and his people. And uh, just for some terminology here, um, Montezuma's people were called the Mexica. So Aztec refers to pretty much all of the various peoples under Montezuma's rule. But the Mexica were actually his people. They were the people who lived in the great city of Tenochtitlan. Um, but there were many, many other societies that were uh, generally Aztec that um, had been conquered by um, the Mexicas, by uh, Montezuma's people, the Mexicas. And the all, all of these people were Nahua peoples. They spoke uh, Nahua language uh, of, of one sort or another, uh, Nahuatl language of one sort or another. Um, so that's sort of where, why sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, you shouldn't use the word Aztec. It's because the conquerors themselves were a subset of Aztecs, and they were the Mexica. Um, 
So around 1325, the Mexicas had come south to the, de- the Valley of Mexico, probably, probably coming from the de- deserts of northern Mexico. They conquered the region. Um, they built, on top of another old capital, they built the city that they called Tenochtitlan, um, where eventually the Spanish would build Mexico City. And Tenochtitlan was a huge and magnificent city that uh, greatly impressed the Spanish. It had a central plaza that was surrounded by pyramid temples, the, tall of wh- the tallest of which was 18 stories high. Um, They had an elaborate system of agriculture with both natural and artificial lakes and canals uh, watering their crops. They had an intricate uh, system of governance, uh, very elaborate bureaucracies that allowed them to rule not only the city of Tenochtitlan, but over the other societies, the other cities that they ruled. Um, And the Mexica were a a hierarchically classed society. There were priests. Um, and under those, there were sort of warrior nobles, um, and under those, there were commoners who, who owned land. And their emperor was Montezuma at the time that the Spanish arrived. Now, these other um, Nahua societies, Aztec societies, that were ruled over by the Mexicas, in general, did not find it a great thing to be ruled by them. Uh, the Mexicas ruled by brute force. They forced um, these tributary to societies to pay tribute to them, not only in goods, um, but in human beings for human sacrifice. The, the Mexica believed that um, sacrificing human beings, not their own people, but the people of their tributaries, uh, the tributary states who had to give uh, young people to them, sacrificing to their sun god provided the blood that, uh, that then in turn provided the fertility of the crops. Um, and the fields of the Mexicas, so I said there were these commoner Mexicas who owned the land. The fields were mostly worked by slaves who were uh, labor brought in from these tributary states. So there was, by the time the Spanish arrived, there was a lot of uh, anger and resentment among these tributary states to the Mexica. Um, and let me add uh, one more piece of information uh, about Quet- Quetzalcoatl, um, who was a uh, probably the most important god to the Mexica. Uh, Quetzalcoatl was a, the ancient, an ancient god uh, who had been probably um, known in the region since uh, long before the Mexica arrived. He's an ancient god of sky and wind, often represented as a, as a feathered serpent. Um, and the, ama- with amazing luck for Hernan Cortez and the Spanish, there was a legend existing at the time that Cortez arrived um, that Quetzalcoatl had once ruled the region, but had left, and importantly here, would return. Now, here we run into a bit of a problem of evidence, because after the Spanish came and conquered the region, um, they would hear legends told about Quetzalcoatl linking uh, this ancient god with the coming of Cortez. So the Spanish heard and wrote down later that uh, the Aztec calendar, which uh, the Aztec calendar had a cycle of 52 years, so basically there are 52 named years in a cycle. Um, they said that Cortez came in the same year that uh, Quetzalcoatl had left, uh, so not the exact same year, but some uh, the same named year. So I don't know, either 52 years later or 104 years later or something like that. Um, and in, and they also said, but remember this is after the Spanish conquest. They also said in some of these legends, Quetzalcoatl was said to have a beard and to have lighter skin um, than the Mexicas. But we don't know if those were things that were created later. Um, But let's let's go to this first. Before we do, Kathleen, could you comment on the image we're looking at? When I first saw that, I thought it was like the New Yorker cartoon we have on the title slide. But then when I read the caption, I realized it wasn't. Um, uh, could funny. You just com- yeah, yeah. You could think of a caption. You know, hey, how do you get to Mexico City? But anyway, um, could yeah. you could you just comment on the uh, that image? <clears throat> so this is actually so. Um, one of the things we'll talk about here is there are these sources, and one of the reasons we're talking about the conquest of Mexico here is um, not only is it early, so it's one it's a first contact, but it resulted in some amazing sources that give us some hint of native perspectives and. So this was a drawing originally done by um, by one of the Indians of Telescala, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, now it's been pen and inked over, right? Which is why it looks like somebody did it in the 20th or 21st century. So it's it's in pen and ink, so it shows better. Um, but the original drawing was actually done by a Telescala in the 16th century. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I notice, uh, Richard, I noticed that somebody uh, is asking for some pronunciation help. And I, if anybody wants to type anything over in the side that they want some pronunciation help with, I will, or, or to know, you know, what's the difference between two different things or why would you call something one thing and not another, go ahead and type a question there and Richard will bring it to my attention. And I'll say if I know or if I don't know, which also could be possible. Yes. And uh, also, let me remind everybody, this we are recording this webinar. So if you need help <clears throat> with the pronunciation, you can go back and listen to the recording and um, hear, hear, uh, hear how it's uh, pronounced properly as well. I will need some help with the pronunciations uh, when we get into uh, reading the text like this one. Um, okay, I, I don't know how to say that first word, so you can say it however you like. <laughs> okay. Okay, shall I read this, put it on the table? Do you want a background for it, or do you want to just put it out there now? Um, Let's see. Yeah, let, let me just say that uh, this first excerpt, uh, we're going to meet a man from one of these coastal tributary states. So um, the, the tributary states on the coast, so this is the Gulf Coast of, Mex- of what's Mexico now, were sort of the most recent additions to Montezuma's empire. So they hadn't been under the Mexicas very long. Um, so this source, this particular version of it was written down in 1598, so a few decades after it happened written down by Montezuma's grandson. Um, so he was the, the man who wrote it down was the grandson of Montezuma, the son of Montezuma's daughter. Um, but his father, the author's father, was Spanish. Okay, so why don't, we, why don't I read it and get it out there and we can begin to, uh, to interpret it. A machehual, a common man, came to the city. He went directly to the palace of Montezuma and said to him, Our Lord and King, forgive my boldness. I am from... Chapel Hill. When I went to the shore of the great sea, there was a mountain range or a small mountain floating in the midst of the water and moving here and there without touching the shore. My Lord, we have never seen the like of this, although we guard the coast and are always on watch. Montezuma said to them, go now without delay, do reverence to our Lord, the God. Say to him, your deputy Montezuma has sent us to you. Here are the presents with which he welcomes you home to Mexico. Um, So I was thinking here, if people want to chime in, they could help to answer this first question of uh, what happens here when this man comes from the coast and gives this report? What is Montezuma, how does Montezuma interpret the coming of the Spaniards? Okay. We have a question on the table. How does Montezuma interpret the coming of (coughs) the Spaniards? We've got some people are typing here. We'll just wait. Uh, Quetzalcoatl has returned. Right. Welcome you home to Mexico. The people felt the Spanish were gods coming from heaven. Some more more comments coming in. Okay. Um, But what, but uh, these comments go along with the remarks you just made about the, the myth of Quetzalcoatl and his return to Mexico. So that's not surprising then that Montezuma and his people would frame Cortez's arrival that way, would it? it right. Would be that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we'll see what else comes in, but what, what other points uh, would you like so to I'm, point to in this? Oh, so we have one here. He seems to recognize them as coming from God, but I wonder if he, if he may have reacted the same way for any travelers like that. That's a good question. Um, how would you respond to that? I think it's very hard to know. It, it, it's complicated even more by the fact that this is obviously written down by somebody who experienced, the, or no, who did, whose whose uh, parents and grandparents experienced the conquest, um, and is looking back on it and perhaps coloring it with uh, um, the fact that Cortez did win and uh, was um, you know, that maybe a portent should have referred to him. Um, so. And it's also possible that if it's that if it is true that Montezuma was sort of always on edge, looking for the return of Quetzalcoatl, that uh, he exactly as Amelia says would have uh, would have been on on the alert for any travelers coming from far away. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We have another comment. The Aztec Empire was in a time of great unrest. Montezuma was not terribly popular then, so having the old god arrive was being used by Montezuma as a political motive. Yeah, I think, that's, talking about yeah I think that's a really good point, right, that um, that uh, bringing a god in on your side, whether, you know, <laughs> someone with outside power could have bolstered him in a time when things were not going well for him. 
Mm -hmm. Another comment, it's interesting that he calls himself a deputy. It is also interesting that he uses now and without delay. How would you yeah. comment on that, Kathleen? Um, so I, I, you know, this is this is the what Montezuma is telling him to to go back. That these are the words he's supposed to say to this possible Quetzalcoatl, and that's I think that's why he's saying, "I'm your deputy. I'm under you." Mm -hmm. um, and he sends him presents, right? And, and he says, "Yeah, go, go right. We we don't want to miss him if he's Quetzalcoatl." No, no, him. you want to keep him on your side, as Michelle points out. <laughs> right. Not unlike politics today, if you've got, you know, if you can recruit a powerful ally, you better do it. And then uh, Amelia writes, reminds me of the European divine right to rule. Um, so many parallels with Europe in the way that Montezuma um, uses power. And I think some of it is the fact that it's written down by Europeans and people like this author, who's the descendant of both Spaniards and uh, Mexica. And some of it comes in the language of translation, that the language of power is the language of Europeans that's being written down here. But I also think there's a lot of truth to it, that, that he is mustering different kinds of spiritual and military power for his, uh, for his use, just as early modern European leaders did. Mm -hmm. I think you see that, too. I mentioned that lesson about uh, Father de las Casas, and I think you see that in his letters to the Spanish court. He's comparing the, um, the native society that he encountered with the Europeans. He's saying, oh, he, you know, he talks about uh, lords and vassals and, and it almost draws a direct parallel to uh, yeah. the European court. Right, 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 which which should in some ways make us doubt it a little bit. You know, is he just using the vocabulary he knows or try, even trying to make them seem more familiar than he would have? Or is it just that th these are words that he has and he's putting them to you know, a fairly accurate use locally. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, Montezuma was a powerful leader, even if he was in trouble at the time. Mm -hmm. Let me, I have a, a question, if I may. Oh, up in the first paragraph there, the, uh, the speaker says, um, although we, we guard the coast and are always on watch, what were they watching for? Were, were, they, were they vulnerable to, uh, to ra sea raids by other tribes? Well, I think one of the, I mean, yes, they were, and, and def, even though I said they didn't have sailing ships, there were absolutely possibilities and maybe even a history of people coming by sea to conquer. But I, I suspect what's going on here is that this, remember, this man has come from one of these coastal tributaries to report. I think he may be assuring Montezuma, we haven't let you down, we haven't let on our guard, we're always looking and make sure, because uh, he's doing his own politics, this common man is doing his politics to Montezuma to make sure um, Montezuma thinks that they're completely in line with him. Now, at this very moment, um, the people on the coast are starting to talk to Cortez and try to get him to help them overthrow Montezuma. Um, so so that may add to the, this, this man's... Uh, um, desire to make Montezuma think his people are completely with him when they're not. Right. We have a really interesting comment here from Michael Vernon. I think it's interesting that Montezuma is the first here to refer to the arrival of a, of a god. The, ma <coughs> the, um, the Machihual is reporting something he clearly sees as unusual, but he doesn't describe any sort of divinity to it. In fact, he doesn't interpret it at all. Would that be simply because, you know, he doesn't want to assume to interpret in front of the king or... Or it's so just a mystery. There, yeah, there are multiple ways we can say. He, so he says he's obviously talking about it in terms of, I mean, I mean, he is trying to interpret it a little bit, right? He says, I went to the shore. There was a mountain range or small mountain. So he's trying to describe the ship and moving here and there without touching the shore. So, um, but, but you're right. Then he doesn't read it any further into it. And I don't know if Quetzalcoatl was actually... Um, was in this man's spiritual and religious heritage or not. I think of him as being somebody that everybody in the region um, knew about and thought was important. But it, I, I'm not sure if he would have been as important to this man's people as he was to the Mexica. Um, and also, if we think about how this source got to us, it was written down by a descendant of Montezuma. So the best lines are usually going to go to Montezuma, yeah. right? He's the, 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 the <laughs> first portrayed Montezuma as, as having a lot of foresight. Well, what as, as best that the source can when Montezuma does, makes some pretty serious mistakes. Right. Well, what's the audience for this document? Um, so this is a history. He, this, this man, um, this descendant of Montezuma, grandson of Montezuma, really was a historian. Um, and so I would not certainly say that historians have no agendas. Uh, he wanted to tell the history from the side of the Mexicas. 
Um, there are other accounts, and, and the next one we'll read is is from a different native side, uh, sort of those fighting against the Mexicas. Mm -hmm. um, but this is this is a, an official history um, from a native perspective, but particularly the Mexica perspective, and not one of the other native people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. And one final question, uh, unless our participants have some more questions about this excerpt. Uh, did the Spanish missionaries make anything of um, Cortez's apparent divinity? I mean, did they, did they use that in any way to help foster uh, Christian uh, conversions? Well, they mostly found it extremely troubling. Um, they did not want Indians to think that Cortez was divine because they did, certainly didn't think he was. Mm -hmm. um, so they tried to channel that pretty quickly into calling that all part of the old idolatry and the old wrong way of seeing the world. And, and that, uh, yes, the Spanish were bringing God, were bringing Christianity to replace the old system of beliefs. But they say over and over, but it's not Cortez. <laughs> he's not God, um, and he's not even close to it. Well, did Cortez himself capitalize on that in his conquest? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yes. So he was telling them he had God on the, on his side. No, yes, right, right, absolutely. Yeah. So did, did Cortez and the missionaries clash over this? Um. Yeah, Cortez and then the other conquistadors and the missionaries were were always at each other's throats um, on matters of doctrine like this and just generally on on why they were there at all. Um, mm -hmm. Were they there to convert people or were they there to sort of you know take over their society in a different kind of way? Right, right. And again, to refer, to refer to that Las Casas lesson, you see that in the texts we offer there. Right, right. That's great. That, yeah. Well, if there are no other comments from our participants on this one, shall we move ahead then? Yeah, so let me just speak for a moment about um, what Cortez is doing there, which many of you already know. Um, the first Spanish colonizing took place in the West Indies, where Columbus uh, landed for the first time. And uh, um, as, as those colonies grew in their early years, they uh, mined for gold and for silver. And so they very quickly, the Spanish who were operating the mines, wanted slave labor to work in those mines. Um, the, the people, the native people of the island died very quickly of disease or escaped as fast as they could on canoes to the mainland or to other islands to get away from the Spanish. Um, so the Spanish went searching for labor, basically. Um, and that led to a series of slave raids by Spanish ships on the course, coast of both North America and South America. Um, and in fact, many um, Native Americans in what's now the United States met their first, uh, you know, their um, the the first in, the real first encounters between North America and Europeans were the sort of anonymous slave raids that didn't leave a mark in the historical record. Um, but in 1519, the governor of Cuba, so Cuba had uh, been colonized by that point, uh, sent Hernan Cortez on one of these. Um, raiding slash trading missions to establish a trading post on the mainland on what, on the coast of what would become what would be Mexico and uh, also to raid slaves in the region but when Cortez got there he pretty quickly started talking to people who told them they had been recently uh, they had been recently conquered by the Mexicas by Montezuma's people um, and they told him about this wealthy empire in central Mexico and, and basically how much they hated it and how much they would love to have a powerful ally to help them take it down and get its gold. So Cortez uh, marched with them from the coast and in this next uh, uh, this next piece, he comes across the Tlash Collins. Uh, so the Tlash Collins are um, extremely important in the history of the conquest of Mexico. They're linguistically and culturally similar to the Mexicas, but entirely opposed to them at this point. Um, so at this point, when, when we get to this source, um, the Tlash Collins have had some sort of initial fighting with the Spanish and debate, debate among their own leaders about what to do about the Spanish, but, they, but they've uh, now decided they're going to ally with the Spanish. And they start talking about another neighbor. So this is a third people in the region, the Chol Choluas. Cho Cholulas. <laughs> okay, shall we read this one? <clears throat> yeah. And, and let me just say that, that this source was, um, this is a different, uh, the source comes to us in a different way. This was written down right after the fact, right after the conquest of Mexico by a Franciscan friar who was taking testimony from people who had survived it. Well, before we read it, what, what was the friar's motive and who was his audience? Um, so 
this in this case this this Franciscan friar Sahagun as as close as is possible wanted to get down the testimony the the sort of direct um, evidence of what had happened during the conquest and um, a, a major motive of his generally was to um, was to convert people to Catholicism, but to, to Christianity. But he also uh, really uh, really wanted to get down what had happened as well. And and so it, it does seem that that the testimony was in many ways pretty much directly written down. Though obviously there are problems of translation. Um, but some of it was taken in Nahua, and some in Spanish. Okay, so <clears throat> at this time the Tla the Tlash Tlashkala were enemies of the Cholula. They feared the Cholula Tecas. They envied and cursed them. Their souls burned with hatred for the people of Cholula. This is why they brought certain rumors to Cortez so that he would destroy them. They said to him, Cholula is our enemy. It is an evil city. The people are as brave as the Aztecs, and they are the Aztecs' friends. So I thought on this, in this and, and the larger reading, if, if, for those of you who've done that, um, I'd like to just talk about what are the motives of the Tlaxcaltecas or the Tlaxcalans, or sort of called either one of those. Okay, well, what about, <clears throat> what will be the motives here? Um, while we're waiting for some comments, uh, Kathleen, if you could comment on um, a, a, a question about a book here, uh, The Conquest of Mes Mexico by Bernal, and then someone else uh, suggesting The Conquest of New Spain is Bernal Diaz's book. What what text are we talking about there? That's right. Michelle has exactly answered the question. It's uh, um, so there are sort of two sources that come immediately after the conquest. One is is this effort of the friars to write down native accounts. The other is this most famous Spanish account, which is a long account of this completely the Spanish perspective of what happened uh, uh, when Cortes con conquered Mexico. Um, so the two together are just an amazing set of sources. Mm -hmm. And um, we in another. Um, seminar, we used a volume called The Broken Spears. Could you comment on that? Yeah, The Broken Spears is a wonderful collection. And anybody who has read Bernal Diaz's book or wants to um, sort of read a shortened version of it, with Broken Spears is a, it, um, it, I can't remember if it has Diaz in it. I, I I can't remember if it has Diaz in it as well or not, or if you would just read it along with Diaz, but mostly what it is are these accounts that were either taken right after, like this one was uh, written by the Talash Collins or other peoples, um, and then also that account that the first quotation came from, um, from the history that was written by the Mexica later on. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it puts them in chronological order for you so you can sort of follow the sequence of events, but occasionally when, when there's a source, say, with this one, uh, a source from the Chaluans and a source from the Talash Collins who tell very different versions of what happened. It'll put them both in, you, in, in there so you can read them both. It's, it's really great. There's also another one, in, uh, a shorter but sort of similar one um, that includes some of Diaz. So, so the one that uh, Richard just mentioned is called The Broken Spears, um, the Aztec account of the conquest of Mexico, edited by Miguel Leon Portilla. Um, and then there's another one called Victors and Vanquished, which uh, it's subtitled Spanish and Nahua Views of the Conquest of Mexico. So it intersperses, that, that's the one I was thinking of, that intersperses Diaz um, with um, various Nahua, various Mexica and other Aztec versions of what happened and also I think puts them in chronological order, so um, more or less, so you can kind of follow different versions of what happened at different points during the conquest. They're both, both really cool. Good. Well, getting back to our discussion question, Pat Marshall writes, <clears throat> so framing the incident in terms of good and evil, they are enticing Cortez to side with them. It's br rather brilliant politicking. Yes, yeah. I have that right? Right, right, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, I, I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about why they also, so they say they're, they're our enemy, it's an evil city, but they also say they're brave, and they're as brave as the Aztecs, and they're the Aztecs' friends. And, he, and here they're using the word Aztecs to mean just specifically Montezuma's people, the Mexicas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, while we're waiting for some comments on why they would characterize the Aztecs as brave, we have some other comments on the uh, Tlaxcaltecas. They wanted to get rid of the upstarts, Mixtecas, from the north. The Tlaxcaltecas seem to be playing the instigators in this text at the same time playing on the pride of the Spanish. So that mm -hmm. might help. That might help uh, answer the question you just posed. The people are brave. brave. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, right. you know, yeah. That, that would be a real really conquest, Cortez. <laughs> exactly. I suppose that also, I, I, I see this sort of Cholua uh, um, 
attack. Uh, so the Tlaxcalans and the Spanish go to uh, attack the Toluids as um, as as like yeah, as a test that maybe if Cortez had decided, oh no, maybe let's not do that. Let's go look for the Aztecs that the Tlaxcalans would have decided they weren't particularly good or malleable allies, and they might not have gone to um, mm -hmm. continued on with them. Mm -hmm. So Julia Book writes, they would characterize them as brave so that they would know what they were up against, that, that they were up against people of such great prowess as the Aztecs, similar right. to uh, Right, yeah, I think about. that's right. If the Spanish are going to get scared about the uh, Cholutectas, uh, they're going to get very scared about the Aztecs. They're a lot, a lot more formidable. Mm -hmm. well, what, what, <coughs> what impressed me about this was the... Apparently, the obviously the the Spanish hadn't been on the ground very long in Mexico, and yet how quickly the uh, the natives were integrating them in their in their politics um, and and uh, using them uh, for their own purposes didn't take That's long. Right. Did it? It didn't take long, and that's something you see. So you see it here in Mexico, and, and one of the reasons I use Mexico is, as I said, these these sources that are more native perspective than you get in other places, but. Over and over, when Europeans arrive in Florida or New England or wherever they end up, the local people start, whoever they meet first, starts to teach them about local politics. And what the Europeans think about what's going in the region is completely colored by who they meet first and what these first people tell them about what's going on and who's evil, right, and who's brave and whose side you want to be on. Mm -hmm. So they really shape this, not only the first encounter, but a lot of the things that happen after. What did it, uh, in any of the European sources, do we have any sense that the Europeans knew they were being uh, uh, taken advantage of or, 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 you know, deployed for the natives' purposes? Yeah, yeah. You, and, and sometimes uh, even trying to get out of it and sometimes actually getting out of it, uh, sort of going on to the next place and allying with the enemy they've already been told about, kind of seeing through the um, the way the first few were describing them, but but not always. Often they get pulled in against their will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. We have some other comments here. I think it makes sense that the people are so political. They did have a complex political system. That's right, they've been doing true. it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think one of the things that impresses me about this as well is that it does give you a sense of how sophisticated Native culture was. I think sometimes there's this sense you know, it may come out in the teaching in some senses that they were very primitive and the Spanish were very politically sophisticated. They had courts back in Europe and so forth. But that's not at all the case, is it? That's right. And I wouldn't want, you know, the fact that we're using these from central Mexico to indicate that that, um, that you know, people to the north were more primitive. There were lots of very complicated political societies in the north of North America, too. Mm -hmm. As Pat Marshall writes, when somebody with a reasonably big stick arrives, it's important to buddy up ASAP. Right, <laughs> well exactly. Put. And you know, the Spanish are here with their, there aren't very many of them. Um, and so that weighs against them, but they've got guns. Their guns are terrible. They're inaccurate. They're very difficult to load or use at all. But when they occasionally do work, they are extremely impressive. They make this crazy noise. And if and smoke, and if they happen to hit somebody, which they occasionally <laughs> manage to do, I mean, you can just imagine what it must have felt like to see a gun wo shot wound when you didn't even know such a thing existed. The things that it can do to the human body are terrifying. And then they've also got horses, which are, you know, they're military animals. Horses are military animals in this era. And they've also got mastiffs, um, which are gigantic military dogs. Um, so, yeah, you want these people either gone or on your side. Right, right. Okay, well, um, any other comments on this slide before we move on to the next one, Kathleen? Um, no, I think that sounds good. Um, let's see. Um, so, as you know, the, the Tlush Collins and the, and the Spanish, they, they join together here. They, they defeat Cholua um, and then march on Tenochtitlan. And, it, and the Tlush Collins themselves will become the allies of the Spanish in future conquests up to New Mexico. They're Tlush Collins with Coronado. Um, they play a huge part in many, many first contacts to come with, with other people, um, where I think it's, it's important to remember the Indians. So in this case, the Tlush Collins actually make first contact with, say, the Pueblo people of New Mexico at the same time that the Spanish are making first contact with them. I think it'd be a um, really exciting to sort of do a paper or write a book about these kind of first contacts between different Indian groups who encounter each other as part of Europeans moving around. 
Catherine, but let's move your, on. That's your, that's your next fellowship at the Humanity Center, right? There. <laughs> Can you guarantee me that? Yeah. Uh, uh, no problem. Yeah, great. Um, we have one more. We have two more comments actually on this slide before we move on. Uh, guest writes also maybe the texts are both written from a European perspective, so maybe the speakers are projecting some European sensibilities or political beliefs, as as I suggest in the in the Las Casas lesson that I hope people will take a look at. And then Julie Book writes the narrator here basically tells us what the motives are from his perspective to destroy them. Right. So this is this is a, a Talash Colin telling the story later, but um, but you're right. It's told to a friar who writes it down and puts it in European language. Uh, um, even when they're writing a waddle, the the um, they're sort of going through your, the friar um, or somebody that the friar has trained in writing. Um, so um, so yeah, that's right. But but I but I also like I like the point that the. Um, he says <laughs> that's why they brought rumors to Cortez, so he would destroy them. There's really no mystery there. Mm -hmm. And we have a Pat Marshall asks question. I apologize, this has already been answered. But are there any native texts that recount the first contact? Wasn't isn't the broken spears? Isn't wasn't that a, a translation from the Nuadal? So yeah, that so that's count? what this is. This is an expert, uh, 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 an excerpt uh, from um, from the Nuadal, the, the Sahagun, um, which is part of Broken Spears. So I the um, <laughs> I mean, this is as close as we're going to get. So, because for peoples with no na no written language, they have to at least learn the written language first, and they're going to learn that from friars. So, some of that there's going to be some time for European influence before it gets written down. Um, but but I think these are really great and sort of almost native text, if you will. <laughs> but I think uh, and with students, I think it's a really um, interesting thing to talk with them about. What does it mean? What, what would a native text be? And what is sort of the next best thing? And I think you could sort of talk about how this fits into that category. Um, but yeah, if, if you get the either of those collections we were talking about, the Broken Spears and Victors and Vanquish, they really uh, um, they talk about the different sources and how they were collected. Okay, good. Well, I hope that answers our, your question, Pat. So shall we move ahead? Um, sure. So we're going to move now to another kind of a native source um, as best uh, uh, we can find. Um, so the Montagne were an Algonquin Indian group uh, in what's now uh, the St. Lawrence River Valley of, of eastern Canada. The two um, sort of large linguistic cultural native groups of the northeast um, the northeastern part of North America were the Algonquins and the Iroquoians. So those aren't tribes, those are huge cultural linguistic groups. So the Montagne was one tribe within the cultural group, the Algonquins. Um, they lived on the St. Lawrence River. Um, and this first contact that we're going to look at probably happened between the Montagne and a French fishing boat. Um, so uh, when, when I, to bring up Cartier again, when Cartier came through in, in the 1530s, he was extremely disappointed to find that many of the people that he met already had met Frenchmen, and mostly they were these French fishing voyages who didn't write down that they had met Algonquins or there any kind of Indians. They just uh, just met them and often traded with them, um, and so that's probably where this first encounter is coming from. Okay, uh, back <clears throat> Pierre Pas uh, Pas. Pasteshwan, I hope I pronounced that properly, reported to us that his grandmother took pleasure describing the Indians' astonishment when they, when they saw the first French ship arrive. They thought it must be a moving island. Our Indians said that the French drank blood and ate wood, also referring to wine and hardtack. Since they couldn't understand what nation the French came from, they gave them a name which was referred to the French, which has referred to the French ever since, and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that. That is a man who works with wood, or one who is in a canoe or boat made of wood. Um, so this is an account. If you if you read this in the the full version in the packet, um, this is an account that comes to us through several different steps. So it happened sometime in the early 1500s. And as you can see, you can sort of trace in this first paragraph um, where it comes from. I don't know if anybody wants to sort of try to answer that in the 
um, in the chat or if it's easier for me to just uh, maybe I'll just sort of outline it while um, while people think about the the question of how did the Montagnet react to the arrival of the French and what's going on in these two two uh, um, parts of the story. So basically, um, it happens in the early, this contact happens in the early 1500s between the Montagnet and a French ship. His uh, it, it gets passed down. Montagnet generations tell this story, um, and finally the grandmother of this Pierre uh, Pastechuan. Um, tells him the story. He is Montagné. Um, he's been baptized Catholic. That's why he has this name, Pierre. But uh, he's Montagné. And then Pierre tells the story to the missionary, the French missionary Paul Lejeune, um, who writes it down in 1633. So it's basically been passed down among the Montagné for a hundred years, at least a hundred years, probably a little more than that. Um, and then uh, we trans my dad translated it into English for our collection in 2009. So that's how it gets to us. Um, so if you look at, at what this story says, what, what it, the Montagnais are saying here about their first encounter with the French, what, how do you think they, what do they say they reacted to the French? In what way? Okay. What can we make of this text? How did the French react, how did the, the uh, Native Americans, the Montagnais, react to the French? We have some uh, typing coming in. One thing for sure, they didn't see them as gods. So they're not framing them in their in their mythology the way right. the Aztecs right. did. Exactly. Yeah. So let's see. We've got a number of <clears throat> people writing their comments. The French uh, drank blood. The Montagnier must have been fearful. Oh. Yeah. Right. Right. That's not that's not good. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they're eating wood too. It's a heart attack. <laughs> so, yeah. They drank blood. Okay. We've got some more uh, responses coming in. Um, was yeah, it so really? it was really, it was really wine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I, I like the point about was it possibly disdain? I. Yeah. Let's see what else. Uh, astonishment. Say. Thought it might be a moving island. Amazed at seeing something so very different in the natural world that they had never seen or heard before. What strikes me about that too is that here you have these Indians comparing the unknown to the known, an island, and you had the Aztecs comparing the unknown to the known. Um, mountains at sea, so Mountain, they, they right. yeah they were framing them in, in a natural uh, uh, context. Um, mm -hmm. It might have tasted better than heart attack. The natives' reaction appears to be much more natural. Uh, definitely some shock, but more curiosity than fear, or trying to explain their arrival. Yeah, it's um, a real contrast, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what would you? How would you account for that contrast? Would it be the difference in? Uh, uh, mythologies. I mean, if, if Montezuma is sitting there waiting for Quetzalcoatl to come back and somebody shows up who fits the description, that is going to instill some fear and trembling. Oh my God, you know, it's the, the God has returned. Whereas apparently the Montagnier had no such myth. I think that's right. I think they don't have a myth like that. They also, if you just want to put it at the most simply, it's I just have the feeling the Montagnier were just a society less on edge than. Yeah. Um, than the Mexica or all the Aztecs at the time that the Spanish arrived. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and Amelia writes, Amelia writes, it's slightly off topic, but they refer to the friendship as a floating island. Is there any way connected to the creation stories which often refer to the land as floating in space or moving on the sea? So there is a potential mythological connection. How would you respond to that, Kathleen? That is a really interesting question. I have never thought about that before. And I so that makes me want to see if there's a Montagne creation story that survives or, you know, some sort of closely related Algonquin group and see if that is in their creation story. Cause cause she's right. That's that's in some creation stories, but I'm not sure if it's in Algonquin's generally mm -hmm. and, and certainly not sure if it's specific to Montagne. Mm -hmm. Really cool. And we have another question. How did the Montagnier feel about woodworkers? And that, that's <laughs> interesting because um, if you stop to think about it now, this, this tribe, they were on the St. Lawrence. They obviously got around. They had canoes and they were made of wood. So right. uh, they don't seem hugely impressed other, other than drinking blood. These are guys who just have canoes like we do. You know, yeah, they don't, yeah, they've got big they canoes. Seem, yeah. yeah, they don't seem yeah. bowled over by them. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the one of the things I love about this source is that 
the Indians see the people who come to them. So they don't, they're not in France, right? They aren't seeing the way French people live. They're, they think that French people drink blood and eat wine. I know. Well, I guess, I guess blood, that, that, the wine would, uh, would work in France too, but they, they think French food is hardtack, which I think is hilarious. I, oh, I realize I typed it wrong. It should say hardtack, obviously not hard track, but, um, uh, but French food is even in the 1500s. I think French yeah. food was better than hardtack. Um, and and also it, it often happens that natives say one of the first things they say to Europeans is why don't you have any women? Um, oh. Because they're, they're traveling without women. And in fact, traveling without women for natives was often a sign, which makes sense of that of that you were a military party and not a not a peaceful party if you didn't bring women. Mm-hmm. Well, we have uh, an answer. Algonquin yeah. Creation Myth. Awesome. No islands. Uh, well, that would have been a cool find that we might have made I here know. tonight. We, yeah, that was another fellowship at the center, you know, for, for that. <laughs> That's right. But but that, um, uh, Michelle's finding there uh, supports uh, Richard's, Richard's point that this is a pretty mundane uh, accounting of this encounter. They are not particularly impressed they they don't think this has anything to do with the creation of the world or anything that important this is a, mm-hmm. just some kind of weird guys now we're, we're going to see later on in a, <coughs> excuse me in another <coughs> excerpt the french interacting with with the natives um could you could you talk a little bit about how the <coughs> the french attitude toward natives differed from that of the spanish they were both trying to make converts, but I gather there was quite a, a difference in the way they responded to the natives. Right. So the French end up um, in Canada and also later in Louisiana having, just being more willing than the Spanish to um, to tolerate the basic inclusivism of native religion that, uh, so Christianity and Islam and Judaism are exclusivist religions. You're supposed to believe in that religion and nothing else. So if you convert to it, you're supposed to get rid of all your old religious beliefs and, and adopt the new ones. Now, of course, that doesn't always happen in those religions either, but that's that's the theology of all of those. Um, whereas most native religions, maybe all native religions before the arrival of Europeans, were inclusivist. If you found an interesting God, uh, a spiritual belief or practice that seemed powerful or useful, you could add it to what you already believed. You didn't have to get rid of your old beliefs and practices Mm -hmm. um, unless they directly contradicted each other. So now missionaries, Catholic missionaries, find this extremely upsetting. This is not the way converts are supposed to act. And there are plenty of accounts of Spanish missionaries uh, um, just getting extremely violent when they discover that people they thought had converted to Catholicism um, had not completely, in their view, had, they had retained some of their beliefs and practices. Now, the French, um, there, are a couple, there are a few reasons why the French tend not to react to, um, with as much violence or to, to demand the kind of extreme, complete conversion that Spanish friars often did. One is that, that these, at least, um, uh, in this region, uh, these French missionaries were often Jesuits, and Jesuits just tended to be a little more okay with subtlety. Um, but also, in the places where the French went, they had less power than the Spanish did in central Mexico and in the islands. And if if roles had been reversed, if the French had been able to um, come in with, with a lot of power and, and tell natives what to do, um, and the Spanish had ended up in places where they were the balance of power was not in their favor, and and, and natives had more power, the way they did in New France. Um, things might have been could have been just the opposite. So it may not have come out of any sort of, uh, you know, the French being better or nicer or more tolerant, uh, and just a, an effect mostly of the fact that they didn't have that much power. Right. Well, Jennifer uh, Alhorn, I hope I've pronounced your name right, uh, Jennifer, raises an interesting point here. Uh, she talks about uh, both the French and the Spanish were looking for converts, but the French in North America, at any rate, were looking for beaver furs, the Spanish in Mexico, gold. Now, right. Well, the, the French wanted to look for gold, so uh, the French okay. tried, <laughs> tried to find gold in Florida and got beat by the Spanish from there. So the beaver furs were sort of their second or third choice. But that's right. By the time they come here, um, they're inter- they, then they start to found New France. That's exactly what they're doing. They're coming for beaver furs. Mm-hmm. And 
that requires good relationships with local people. And that's, and that's what they did. So with people like the Montagne, the French established long-term trade relationships mm -hmm. um, that, that, that relied on, on mutual tolerance and understanding um, just, just for, you know, if for, if nothing else, just for economic uh, reasons and safety reasons that so you needed to get along with the people you were living among and trading with. Right. You can enslave people to work in a mine, but you really can't, it seems to me, you can't enslave people to go out and catch beavers because they're out there in the woods. You can't, you're French, you don't know the way around. You, you That's can't right. Them. So if you were a trader, you could have one slave with you that you made help with beaver hunting. But yeah, you can't right. force a tribe to go hunt beaver and bring them back to you. They're just not going to come back. Right? No, no, no. Um, and I see Mary makes a good point about would it have anything to do with their comparative numbers versus the English. And yes, of course, that's exactly right. It has everything to do. The Spanish come in fairly large numbers to Mexico, not as large numbers to places uh, uh, north of there. Um, but then when the English start coming, their their numbers are just unbelievable compared to other Europeans in North America. Um, and that's one of the reasons the English don't have to, in general, don't have to abide as much by uh, native demands, native ways. Oh, oh okay. well, uh, Michael Vernon writes, I believe you mentioned that this excerpt was originally... <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. This excerpt was originally penned in the 1600s from an oral story passed down for at least 100 years. Could the amount of time that passed between the actual contact and the penning of the story contribute to the mundane nature of the excerpt with regular contact with the French and maybe Pierre wasn't as excited as the Montagnier uh, who first met the French? That's a good point. Has the story you know, got a little shop worn over, over a century? This, I think this is a story that is in part making fun of ancestors, saying uh -huh. they thought the French drank blood and ate wine. Isn't that hilarious uh, that they didn't know the French whom, yes, we've known for more than 100 years. They're our brothers. They're, they're, not, that, they're, they're not that unusual to us. Um, and so I think, I think both. There's not this sense of awe at the French. Um, but then there's a little humor in here, too. May, I, I think making fun of both the French and the Montagne ancestors. Mm -hmm. uh, Claire writes, weren't the French also not as pressured by their government than the Spaniards were? Uh, the French weren't offered such rewards as the Spanish explorers were. Were the French getting as much pressure from Paris as the uh, Spanish were from Madrid? Right. Well, they yeah, the French never set up the kind of uh, encomienda system where conquistadors can get uh, huge plots, or either big plots of land or sort of the right to the tribute of a certain group of native people. It, yeah, it just it doesn't develop that way. So there is much less reason for French people to uh, um, to go to the Americas. Mm -hmm. okay. my, French, my French ancestors say it's because why would anyone ever want to leave France? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a, a good point. Well, you, can, well, you go to you can go to New Orleans, you know. So. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, did pressure increase with Colbert's ascendancy? Now that's 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 one on me. I don't know. I'm, I don't know anything about Colbert's ascendancy. I hope you do, Kathleen. Uh, I, I suspect Mary knows more about it than I do. Okay. All right. Maybe. Uh, Mary could elaborate on that a, a, a bit. But uh, if there are any other points you want to make on this one, Kathleen, we can go ahead and do that and then uh, move ahead. Okay, let's see. Um, no, I think I think I, I was going to get to the point about humor, but uh, you all got there, so that's great. Okay, well, shall we move ahead then? Sure. Um, so I don't know if this was in your assigned readings, um, so you, you all may or may not have had a chance to read this. But uh, And if you don't have access to it, I'll make sure um, you can get... Um, the whole thing. All of it comes from uh, John Smith's general history. Oh, I see. Mary, uh, to go back, Mary's talking about the, the sort of um, the desire to get women and family groups to go to New France and, and subsequently to Louisiana. So, so they end up shipping. Uh, uh, so there is some pressure on, um, on people, but it still remains at a small scale. Um, at, at most of those ventures end up being um, sort of useless. There's there's a tale of a, a big ship of uh, of women. They they sort of scoop up off the streets of Paris and and send to New Orleans because they need women. But they're um, they they didn't do it again. It, it tended not to. Um, not to. Well, let let me ask a question. Let me ask a question about the inclusion of women now. Um, 
the uh, Roanoke colony, that included women, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And the Lost, the lost Colony had, had women in it. Mm -hmm. so I, was that a... Um, I've, I've read that that, was a, that actually, in terms of settlement, was a problem. Um, and I read that the, the, the British sent sort of the wrong kind of people to the lost colony. Is that, is the, is that true? Is that accurate? That they sent people who really weren't accustomed to working hard and they, uh, the women um, sort of inhibited the development of the settlement. Well, I think that, I, I mean, they tended, uh, I, I, there tended to be men who either were there to get rich quick or were just the urban you know most of the men and women who were made to go were mostly the urban poor right. and uh, they, they did not have farming skills that's that's for sure okay well shall we get to the Pohatans and the english okay great um so the english had really turned inward in the first half of the 1500s with their own religious wars um, but they began to look again toward the americas um, in the sort of second half of the 1500s with the rise of elizabeth the first and the sort of consolidation of protestantism in england um, of course there's there's great stuff from roanoke the exploration uh, and attempt of settle several attempts to settle roanoke um, but this reading comes from uh, the settlement of jamestown in 1607 the English had intended to settle the Chesapeake Bay region even in some of the some of the times that they ended up in Roanoke so this is uh, they finally got to the Chesapeake um, where the leader of the Indians in the region in the early 1600s was was called Powhatan um, Powhatan was his title people pronounce it in various ways so if you are accustomed to pronouncing it in a different way with your students that's fine people say uh, Powhatan or Powhatan or some various other things. Um, his title that was really the title that he had, and it came from his hometown, which you can see it's the top red circle, the circle that I've um, made on this map, was the town of Powhatan around uh, where, where Richmond is today. At the time that Powhatan inherited his chiefdom, either from his father or his uncle, um, because they were probably matrilineal, matrilineal. Um, he had ruled over about, uh, his fa father or uncle had ruled over about six chiefdoms, but Powhatan conquered another 20 or so um, through persuasion in some uh, cases, through force in some cases. So you can sort of see on this map um, the big letters written, the kind of, there's a P right beside the, the picture in the top left hand corner and then it sort of traces down so you can see Powhatan is written across the whole map uh, to show that this whole region now is his by 1607. Mm -hmm. um, so by 1607 he had left his heir or either his son or his nephew we're not sure in charge at the town that was called Powhatan at the northern part of the map and he was ruling the whole chiefdom. Powhatan was reading the whole chiefdom from Roam Warowo Komoko, um, which you can see is the bottom of those red circles. It, it, um, notice this map uh, north is actually to the left, to the side. Um, so if you're wondering how the Chesapeake Bay ended up looking like this, um, and the Virginian Sea that it says there is, is heading toward the Atlantic. But uh, so the capital basically of Powhatan's territory is that bottom red circle. Um, now, it seems that Powhatan had established his power in ways that were a bit more palatable to local people than, for example, Montezuma, who um, had made everyone so angry with human sacrifice and such. Um, Powhatan had a political strategy of establishing marriages or marriage-like arrangements with women in all of the places that he conquered and having children that um, were important to him. Uh, therefore in all of these places and and one of those children was Pocahontas so Powhatan had a, a great deal of power probably but certainly not absolute power probably not what Montezuma had um, if these local places these local chiefdoms paid tribute to him um, mostly he let them be ruled by their wearer rances their inferior sort of inferior kings as John Smith calls them and there's at least one female one uh, that we'll meet in the next slide um, in, in the document, if you read it, the, the Queen of Appomattox. So Appomattox is that third thing that I've, I've circled just right below the picture of Powhatan. Um, and it's where Appomattox, of Appomattox Courthouse gets its name, this um, 
this uh, chiefdom or town within Powhatan's empire. Now, in 1607, this is one of these sort of fake first encounters where the English kind of think that this is a first encounter, that they're the first Europeans to come here. Um, but in fact, the Powhatans had had a lot of interactions with Europeans before. Um, at least one Powhatan person had been to Spain. Um, he had come back with Jesuit missionaries in the 1500s. And we don't know exactly what happened, but the Powhatans ended up killing the Jesuit missionaries, all of them, um, uh, after this uh, one of their own had led them back. Um, so this is a place that has become quite familiar with Europeans. That probably doesn't have a particularly good impression of them from their experience with the Spanish. And this is where the English show up in 1607. They show up looking for gold and expecting to be fed. And the Powhatans pretty quickly become sick of them. Um, for example, when, when a group of 17 colonists comes to one of the towns demanding food, um, the people of the town killed them and stuffed corn in the mouths of the corpses to make, basically make the point <laughs> that they had come seeking food and, uh, and this is what they got for it. Um, so then the Powhatans, they capture, Governor Gaunt, uh, they, they capture Captain John Smith when he's out in the woods and they bring him to Warokomoko. Um, and so this account is going to come from Smith's general history from 1624. Okay, uh, before we get <clears throat> to this, we, we have a question uh, from Jennifer here. Do we know why they killed the priests? Uh, that, so, uh, so this is a fascinating story. This, is, uh, this man's name was uh, Paquiquineo. And then when he was baptized by the Spanish, he was known as Luis de Velasco. So I'm baptized as Luis de Velasco. So he is in Spain, He and he tells the Jesuits, um, I want you to come home with me and um, and, and teach, teach Christianity to my people. So they get really excited. Several of them go with him. They land there. He introduces them to his people. And what we have are the first few letters that a, a, a ship comes and, and brings them more supplies. And so they, a few letters that they had written over the course of their, I forget, a few months, first few months there. Um, we have those letters. And then we don't have any more letters from them because they get killed after this and, and there, there's no more. Um, the, the Spanish come later and, and can't find, the, uh, or find out that they've been killed. And, and the Spanish sort of um, uh, uh, kill some people in return, but then leave and don't come back. But these first few letters talk about this sort of thing that seems to happen over and over. We, um, we uh, asked them for food. They brought us food. We're getting along really well. And then the next letter will say, well, things maybe aren't going that great. And they're just little hints that, uh, um, that the relationship is not that good. And so one possibility is just that this man who said that he wanted to convert his people to Christianity really just wanted basically a ride home um, as he would, right? And as soon as he gets home, he starts telling his people, these guys who've come with me, they look, you know, they look like, they may look like really important spiritual um, leaders, or they may look not that powerful, they may look vulnerable, but they come from Spain. And let me tell you about Spain. And you can imagine the way he would have described Spain as, um, as powerful and in some ways wanting to, to, to take over the new world um, and he could have taught them a lot in the short amount of time about Spain and its ambitions um, and um, and then all we know is is they were all killed um, and that's that's all the answer we have I think if I'm not mistaken I think we have some excerpts from those letters in the failed colonies lesson so um, see our questioner about uh, uh, the, the participant who asked about uh, why were the priests killed? You might look at that failed colonies lesson that I mentioned earlier. I think we have some texts in there. Um, anyway, shall we go ahead and, and put uh, John Smith's testimony on the table, Kathleen? Yes, great. Okay. At last, <clears throat> they brought Smith to where Wero Macomico, where was Pohatan, their emperor. Here, more than 200 of those grim courtiers stood wondering at him, <clears throat> I guess that's Smith, uh, as he had been a monster till Poetan and his train had put themselves in their greatest braveries. Before a fire upon a seat like a bedstead, <clears throat> Poetan sat covered with a great robe made of ra rara wolcum skins. It's uh, raccoon, really. Raccoon <laughs> skins, okay. <clears throat> and all the tails hanging by. On either hand did sit a young wench of 16 or 18 years, and along on each side 
the house two rows of men and behind them as many women, with all their heads and shoulders painted red, many of their heads bedecked with white down of birds, but every one with something, and a great chain of white beads around their necks. At Smith's entrance before the king, all the people gave a great shout. The queen of Appomattox, was appointed to bring him water to wash his hands, and another brought him a bunch of feathers instead of a towel to dry them. Um, so this is this sort of iconic meeting between uh, Powhatan and John Smith. So I think one a good question to ask students and to ask today is, um, what kind of impression do you think that this chief is trying to make on John Smith, this newcomer? Okay, how? what kind of impression is Poetan trying to make on John Smith? We've got some people typing here. Uh, interesting, uh, let's see, interesting pieces that plays to European gender roles. Very good comment. All right, Pat Marshall asks, could you give us a sense of your impression of how much this is Smith's recounting a relatively accurate report and how much is Smith presenting an overly embellished view of the incident to underscore his own importance uh, to his audience? That's that's a good question. I think we're going to come to that. Uh, Jennifer writes, Poetan is trying to say that he is very powerful, strong, and loved. Michelle, like he's... That loved. That's right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He wants to impress Smith and show off his wealth. Poetan seems as though he is trying to impress Smith. How would you respond to that, Kathleen? And here's one more. Uh, I would say that he definitely wants to impress him. Um, impress on him the wealth of his people. He offers valuable feathers, for instance, to dry his hands. I assume that wasn't standard practice. How would you yeah, respond? Right. That? It feels, yeah, it it feels ceremonial, right? This is this is a, um, this is a, all, all these different things: the 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 beads, the painting, the um, the great robe. This is all on purpose, I think, to impress him. Um, and 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 I also like the beginning, the sort of staring at him as if he were a monster. That gives us another contra a contrast with our uh, mundane Montigny account and our Quetzalcoatl, the great god account. That here Smith is a monster. It seems rather rehearsed too, because at Smith's entrance before the king, all the people gave a great shout. I mean, that almost seems cued, you know. Yeah, so I think we can think of this. So if we think about uh, Powhatan as having conquered these people, including some of these people right who are sitting here with him. So they're making a point to Powhatan. Yes, we're with you when they give the great shout. Mm -hmm. But this is something that probably has happened over and over with new tributaries as they've come in, the leader of various tributaries. Mm -hmm. or, or people that Powhatan wants to make in tributaries. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the, let me could, if I, could I ask a question about the audience for the general history of Virginia? Who was Smith yeah. writing this for? Um, so he's writing it back in eight, in 1624 when he gets back to England, and the questioner is uh, um, uh, whoever said Pat who said that um, of of this Smith is the main character in his story, <laughs> which I think yeah. is what Pat is getting across that he is. Um, probably exaggerating his importance here. But there are other accounts that show that Smith becomes this go-between um, with, with Powhatan and, and that it is um, something happens between Powhatan and Smith that's important here. Another thing that amazes me is the accuracy of Smith's map, that map that was on the first um, the first page. It's He wasn't even there that long and yet he gets this tremendously and, and what, what looks like the extremely accurate uh, map of the region. So I think there's a combination here of, you know, and, and I think going back to our first questions, one of the things we have to think about is his audience and his real, is his motive of kind of self-aggrandizement, which is absolutely there. Um, but I think in the details, we get a little bit of what Powhatan's trying to say here, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jennifer makes a good point. Having a queen... Uh, where'd it go? It slipped, it slipped by me there. Have, the point was having a queen bring John Smith some water um, shows that, uh, here, here we go, <clears throat> having a queen bring him the water shows his power of dominance over everyone. Uh, could Powhatan be, you know, having the queen give the water to John Smith shows that John Smith is important and Powhatan is having getting tribute from Smith, so that enhances Powhatan's own importance. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have a question from Amelia. I also wonder at the description of the people as grim courtiers. I know that in some tribes it's considered shameful to show fear, the Mohawks, for instance. But is there a reason why they would be so serious besides trying to look so impressive? Yeah, it's hard to make put those two things together, right? That grim courtiers and looking at him as if he were a monster, that, that doesn't even seem like the same facial expression. So, mm -hmm. not... Um, I, yeah, I guess it's just seriousness, uh, but yeah. I'm not sure. that they're, they're clearly not, I mean, I think you could find Iroquois ceremonies where they purposely make fun of and taunt a captive. Um, this, just, this is different from that. It's, it's, yeah. and we although, have... <laughs> although going back to Pat's point, it's possible that that's the, that's the last thing he's going to mention is if they, uh, if they made fun of him, right? Because <laughs> that, that sort of makes no, sense. I mean, John Smith. The hero, as you say, of his own story. I wonder if Smith thought that perhaps Poetan was much more civilized than he ever expected. Yeah, so so I think, you know, in this, it, it's hard to know how to read it. Is he seeing these elements of civilization that he recognizes and, and he's impressed and surprised by them? Or is he writing them in later to make European audiences see Powhatan's power. So if you figure Powhatan's extremely powerful and he's showing it, but are there ways that maybe Smith is adding to it to make sure that we, you know, the, the, his 17th century European readers understand that Powhatan's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. We have an yeah, interesting... Yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. I, I would like, now I wish I had my OED in front of me, you know, from yeah. the time and, and to see what exactly Grimm meant in 1624. <laughs> Well, uh, shall we move on to the next uh, slide, uh, if you, unless you have anything else to add to this, or our participants do, because that's the one where the, the famous uh, uh, Pocahontas story in here is. That's right. Okay, shall we get this one on the table? Having feasted him after their best barbarous manner they could, and it's interesting that, that um, if I may just digress for a moment, that Smith is referring to himself in the third person. Having yeah, so he's. He's collected uh, other people's accounts, um, oh, and for, oh. and that's why he he wants to clue us into that by um, shifting person. It's sort of odd. It's it's strange that he does that, yeah. but that's that's what he means by that. Okay, having feasted him after their best barbarous manner they could, a long consultation was held. But the conclusion was two great stones were brought before Powhatan. Then as many as could laid hands on Smith, dragged him to them, and thereon laid his head, and being ready with their clubs to beat out his brains. Pocahontas, the king's daughter, when no entreaty could prevail, got his head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save him from death. Two days after, Poetan, having disguised himself in the most fearful manner he could, caused Captain Smith to be brought forth to a great house in the woods, and there upon a mat by the fire to be left alone. Not long after, from behind a mat that divided the house, was made the most doleful noise he ever heard. Then Powhatan, more like a devil than a man, with some two hundred more as black as himself, came unto him, and told him now they were friends, and presently he should go to Jamestown to send him two great guns and a grindstone, for which he would give him the country of Chappahousic, and forever esteem him as his son, Nanatequad. What is going uh, on there? So I, I see we're, we're moving toward 830, so uh, just to get through this quickly, I think one of the, probably the primary way historians have interpreted this lately, and it may change again, um, is that this was an adoption ceremony, or uh, a ceremony in which John Smith becomes a tributary of uh, an, a Werowans, uh, an inferior king to Powhatan, and that the role of a young woman, a Pocahontas in this case, was to sort of ceremonially beg for his life and allow Powhatan to seem as if he had been just about to kill him. He had the power to kill John Smith, but then wouldn't and would then. And I think, I really think the key is in this last line, um, that Smith should go to Jamestown, send him to great guns and a grindstone, and the culminating thing is Powhatan will give him this country that Jamestown is within and, and treat him as his son, basically make him into one of these werowances like these others that he's over. Mm -hmm. and we have a question. Why did they accept John Smith but not the people who came begging for food? What made him so different? 
So my, I think that the Powhatans are used to, you know, sort of ironically maybe, used to a more hierarchical society, and they don't like that various English people are going around demanding food. They want to deal with one person, and mm -hmm. they, they key on John Smith as maybe the most reasonable, maybe the most powerful. Um, it's not completely sure why they pick him, but, uh, but he's a good choice. Um, and then I think they, you know, if, if the English need to be fed and taught to farm and all these things, they can do that, but it needs to be under the hierarchy the Powhatan has set up. And that means that, that they need a sort of a point person uh, in John Smith. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We have some other um, comments here. I have just, I, <clears throat> I just have trouble, Elizabeth writes, Believing that the episode happened exactly the way, that way, maybe Smith exaggerated or made it up. Is that has that has that ever been suggested? Well, we know Pocahontas is a real person because she ends up in Jamestown later. The the English actually capture her. So, um, and she refers back when she, actually when she goes to England and she meets with Smith there. Now Smith writes this too, so you could you could come up with a conspiracy that Smith has made it all up. Um, but she refers back to this uh, uh, this occasion and says, "You promised me that um, um, that you would be my 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 father's son." Now it is true that this account of this particular thing with Pocahontas here doesn't show up in his in Smith's earlier account. So the the piece about Pocahontas could be the part that he added later, and, and I think that's why um, what's really important, what we really know here, is this relation that Powhatan was trying to set up with John Smith. The exact role of Pocahontas is less obviously you know, a real thing, um, mm -hmm. but I, yeah. Uh, yeah, and Mary points out that there's another, Smith talks about there's another place, I think it's in North Africa, is that, I'm not sure if I have that right, but where he, uh, he, he has a, a suspiciously similar story of a young woman. Well, I asked earlier if archaeology could spread any <clears throat> light on these first contacts. How about anthropology? Have anthropologists discovered similar sort of initiation ceremonies? Yes, and that's why lately historians and anthropologists have talked about this as an adoption ceremony, that it actually was very common to have a, a sort of dramatic moment where it's life or death, and sometimes death is actually what happens, wow. but if life, if, if the person uh, is allowed to live, then they understand that they're under the power of this leader forever. Okay, okay well, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at 8.30. Um, we have one more slide here, Kathleen. Do you want to uh, explore that one uh, quickly? Yeah, sure. So this is just, this is a later account. This is a, one that was actually written down in the 20th century by an anthropologist of uh, a, a story passed down by the Ho-Chunks, who are also known as the Winnebago's. Um, but I just, there's just a little joke in the first one. Uh, they saw, a, a Frenchman saw an old man smoking, so this is a, a Ho-Chunk, a, a native man smoking, and poured water on him. They knew nothing about smoking or tobacco. So it's sort of the inverse, like the French are learning uh, these things that later they know very well. So it's a, it's a you know, laughing at the French. Um, and then I just put this last part in there to show the growing relationship here. I think that we, we saw similarly with the Montigny and the French, but here more explicitly between the Ho-Chunks or the Winnebago's and the French. After a while, they got more accustomed to one another. The Indians learned how to shoot the guns and began trading objects for axes. Um, they would give furs and things of that nature for guns, knives, and axes of the whites. Um, they still consider them holy, however, but, but by this time they had learned to make themselves understood by various signs. So it's sort of, this is part of an oral history of a developing relationship that gets us past the first encounters. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to what could be the final question of our first encounter ser uh, seminar, and what when do first encounters end? What would, Kathleen, what would you say would, would be the the demarcation of first encounter moving over into, you know, going steady. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think it, it can happen pretty quickly. One of the things, one of the ways you could mark it is when you can tell a story about it. So when you start to talk about, remember back when we first met and, and how we didn't really understand each other and now we do. Like this, like this excerpt right here. <laughs> right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> we now have come to the end of our seminar, so let me ask if there are any final comments or questions, and while we're waiting for responses there, Kathleen, let me thank you very much for giving us an excellent seminar. I learned a lot, and I think our participants did as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard.
And ladies and gentlemen, please uh, check out um, all of the social media that we're on all of them now, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, and, and uh, YouTube. So please um, take a look at those, connect with us. And if you want to learn the flip side of Native Americans encounter uh, encounters with Europeans, tune in next week, October 8th at 7 p.m. when Kathleen will be back to discuss Europeans meeting Native Americans. Again, Kathleen, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our participants. Your uh, responses, your participation tonight has been excellent. I've enjoyed it, and I hope you will be back with us next week. So for this evening, ladies and gentlemen, good night.